now for your listening pleasure, here's Polizzi and Rose, covering the week of media, marketing, and digital content news. This old marketing. Take it away, boys. Hello, my friends. This is Robert Rose, and welcome to episode number 311 of This Old Marketing, recorded on February 17th, 2022. And with me, as always, my good friend, my colleague, and a guy who definitely did not take a knee at the Super Bowl halftime show, Mr. Joe Polizzi. Did you watch it? Did you watch the halftime show? You know what? It's funny. I... This is probably the most I've ever scrutinized the Super Bowl ads as well. I mean, I really did pay attention this year because sometimes I don't. Sometimes we're having a party. Right. No party this year. My wife and I, we just watched everything. And I honestly didn't know what Eminem was doing. At the time, I'm like, why is he kneeling? Like, I didn't. I thought maybe oh, you didn't, he just tapped out. You didn't put two and two together. Right? I didn't really get it until he tapped out. I didn't, it's like <laughs> it's like, whew, that's the most performing I've done in a long time. Done. Yeah. By the way, I love Eminem. It was so good. I, I I I thought the whole halftime show was. I mean, look, Mary J. Blige. I mean, any time, right? I mean, I could good. have had a whole. She was probably show the best, of just though. Mary J. Blige. I agree. I think Mary J. Blige was the best. Uh, I thought she was awesome. Um, but the show was good. <laughs> Jay Bear, he, on Facebook, he posted this thing that just made me sort of chortle out loud where he said, he said, they assembled the entire Barbie dream house <laughs> on the field. I know, isn't that crazy? <laughs> I was like, what? I loved yeah, it. what is going on? The whole thing, I guess, <laughs> for, I have a couple comments on, on the halftime show. First of all, I didn't think it was one of the best of all time. I thought it was good. No, I agree. I don't think I it's agree. you can't no, put it, it didn't next even to come Prince close to Prince. some of the other ones. Yeah. I'm sorry, you just can't. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, so, and and I have a problem with. There was a lot of the. I think this was covered a little bit in the news. There was a lot of the lip syncing that didn't sync up so well. And that's and right. That that always bothers me. Like even yeah. Now Mary J. Blige, she did those two songs together. The first one, she was sort of singing over. You know her own voice, so you knew that was going on. But the second one almost seemed live to me. So I maybe maybe it was. It was fascinating. But what the heck? I think the second song she was singing live. Yeah, I think the second song she was singing. The music was obviously pre-taped, sure. but but the but the 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 I think she was singing over it live. Yeah, and I think that's for the most part what was going on. Even when you were seeing people on stage playing instruments. You know, they're not. I didn't really. see a lot of those instruments. They, they, There's yeah, no, that's they're not, not plugged really, into I mean, anything. None of those things. They're not mic'd up, <laughs> right? Not, none of them were mic'd up. At okay, all. what yeah. what was with the weirdest thing? I and I loved that Fifty Cent was out there, but what the whole thing that he that he came in hanging upside down was just strange. Hanging upside down, yeah, was just. Str- did you did you know that I sat next to him on a plane? Did you know the story? You? I have a picture of it too because he I, fell asleep next to me. And I took a picture with me, like smiling, and Fifty Cent right. next to me. At we, Fifty Cent next. To that you. was when I had all the airline miles, and I was getting first class everywhere. So just so you know, not so you could so the reason why I was next to Fifty Cent. But we walked off the plane together, and we go. Of course, we both have to go to the restroom. We go to the restroom. Sure. He comes yeah. out of there, and there's a couple fans waiting for him outside and say, hey, 50 Cent, can we get your autograph? And he just says, no. And he walks right by, <laughs> right by him. And I'm there. I'm nice. like, I'll sign it. <laughs> of course. Nice. I, like, oh, that's good. They're like, they're <laughs> You're like, like who the I'll heck sign are you, for Mr. You. Orange? Get out of here. Oh, my uh, God. But I just thought that was funny. Have you read it? Did you ever read his book? No. What is it called? 25 Cent? Uh, uh, no. Good gracious. <laughs> I don't jokes know. galore from no, you what, today. What, what, what um, it, it, I, I can't remember the title off the top of my head, but um, it's basically his autobiography okay. where he talks about his business investing and how he, you know, his philosophy on it's a, it's actually a really good book. Um, and he talks about his bit. And one of the things he talks about, of course, is, you know, being stanky rich. Um, and I have to tell you that. So my own, my only connection to 50 cent is my wife and I have one of our joint savings account. You know, you can name your accounts in our online banking. Yeah. And one of our little savings accounts is called Stanky Rich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we call it the Stanky Rich account. It's, it's always like, the oh, where are you putting that check? Connection. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah the, exactly. the weirdest 
there was some so many weird. So, anyways, I like the halftime show, but the fact that they had Dre sitting in front of what was supposed to be a turntable and a production studio, pretending oh, to produce. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't like it. It's just weird. You didn't have it to. It's just do that. you know. I mean, I think. Well, here's the thing. You know, at some point there's a production meeting, right, where they're all sitting around going, "Look, we got what was it five five of them." Eminem, Mary J. Blige, Dre, Lamar. Yeah. Um, uh, Had Kendrick Lamar. That's it. Yeah. And am I missing anything? Yeah, there was some other guest that wasn't wasn't announced ahead of time. Oh, Snoop. Snoop. Well, Snoop is the the main one, actually. He did more than anybody. And, and, uh, yes, (laughs) Snoop smoking weed before the thing. It's very funny. Like, why is that a news Um, story? Of course. He, he's always said. Of course he did. Yeah. By the way, it's legal. It's here in California. It's, it's, he wasn't doing anything illegal. He was, you know, basically, you know, drinking a beer for, for, for lack of a better metaphor. It didn't seem to hurt his performance. If anything, I think that helps his performance. Uh, uh, Maybe. uh, You know, but. Yeah, I think, you know, with fitting that many people into a, you know, I I, I don't I didn't measure the time, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it's probably 22 minutes or something like that. I mean, it's very short. It's a sure. very, very short little show. You just can't, you can't do that much, right? You know, you just, you have to keep things really simple. And, uh, you know, cause, so there's no miking up everybody and there's no getting instruments going and there's no, you just don't have time. You just don't have time for that level of setup. And so it's, I think they did the best they could with getting that many people in and trying to make it sort of a, you know, an homage to all of the classic. Yeah. Yeah. So I applaud for what they tried to do. Um, but I agree it wasn't, you know, it started to, you know, it started, it started to look a little cheesy when they're like pretending to do stuff. And it's like, yeah, no, you're not. You're not doing that. One thing I don't yeah. understand, maybe you know and you, you read up on this, but they didn't play nothing but a G thing, which is was the one that went was so popular at the time when it came out. That was it. That was everything. I remember I actually had that C D with the marijuana leaf on the cover, Dre's yeah, Dre's album. Sure. And did they not play that because Snoop didn't own the rights to Death Row Records at that time? Because that just happened. Uh, that he's going to yeah. turn that yeah. into yep. an NFT label, the first NFT label, yeah. if you will. Um, That's right. So yep. do you know anything about that? I'm surprised that they I didn't do, play the I, most popular song they've ever done with each other. I I don't know why they didn't choose that song. Yeah. I mean, I like that they gave the homage to Tupac. Um, yeah, and California makes sense. Know, I mean, he that was yeah. he, he was on that song, that track. So. Right. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know why they chose what they chose. Um, but basically, you know, I, I yeah, who knows? It's so knows interesting though. I mean, there's so much, there's a number, there's a number of songs that they could have played, right. That they could have, that they could have played, but they didn't. Who was the, who was the guy that performed last year? Do you remember? <laughs> That's funny. I don't. Yeah. Actually. It was the one more, the Gen Z millennial, whatever nobody remembers it because we're not we're gen x and we don't we don't know these things right but this one right the i don't think it's i think they did this purposely to focus on a halftime show to go after the largest possible audience and that it really is gen x right now with when you look at football fans and they they basically took that halftime show and said (laughs) let's just go right for the sweet spot those that were born between 1967 and 1980 this will be perfect well yeah, did you see the? There was a lot of social media going on about that, where somebody posted up that said, "If you, if you, basically, if you really loved this year's halftime show, it's time for your prostate." Or time for, I saw it's time for a colonoscopy. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. and then you know what? It's true. It's absolutely yeah. true. Because what 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 year did I get the the chronic? I bought the chronic. I think it was in nineteen ninety two. Is that right? That'd be about right. Uh. Yeah, it's about All right. right. Yeah. yeah, 92, 93. I had it in college. Uh, I would say 91. I would go maybe the other 90, way. Okay, yeah. maybe it was 91. Um, I mean, I remember, it's funny, because I remember 
92, 93 for the Chronic, and I had that DVD, the, not DVD, CD. And then in 91, I had Red Hot Chili Pe- Peppers, uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. So those, you know, it's funny how when you're that age, you remember them by, <laughs> by the albums right. you purchased. Do, they don't, people don't do that anymore. Exactly. nobody buys albums anymore. 1992, by the way. 92. Chronic okay, was released so December, de- Christmas, basically Christmas 1992. Yeah, it's funny. And the reason I remember it so well is because I had just moved to Los Angeles Um, you know, I moved to Los Angeles in 1987 and I was going to be a musician. Right. And, you know, I played piano. Um, and when you arrive in Los Angeles and you're trying to get a gig either in a, you know, either in a cover band or, you know, something to pay the bills, you know, basically the only thing available was grunge rock or gangster rap. And (laughs) They, none of them needed the keyboardist, basically. So, you so know, you were, it was like, oh, so right. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, I'm playing in hotel bands, right? Because, you, know, you know, playing 1980s music. Or <laughs> well, good. I know we're going to talk about the Super Bowl ads, so I'm, I'm fairly excited about that conversation because normally you have to do all the, you know, the perspective for me because I don't watch them all. You generally do. Yeah. So I do have, you actually I sat do, down. I actually watch them all. And whenever I had to take a break, I did it during the game, <laughs> not during yep. the commercials. Yep. Great game, though. What a great game. Uh, what a wonderful game as well. I mean, holy my, shit. My youngest. Was, you know, and, and, and congrats to the L.A. Rams. Absolutely. Right? I mean, congrats you know, to the, them. I feel bad for what happened to OBJ during the game. He was obviously making a difference, but you know, glad he, glad he got the ring. But my youngest absolutely said, hey, the fix was in. They were going to have uh, the roughs were going to have L.A. win no matter what. Say what you want. He no. he's a big Joe Burrow fan. No, so the fix was it, no. The Rams played. A the Rams game. played. Aaron the Rams Donald played, played well out enough, of his mind. The Rams played well enough to win, but so did Cincinnati. But it's just I always think it's odd where they literally have no penalties the entire game until the last drive. They were letting well, they that always call do go that, all day long, and then yeah, they called that holding pass interference call on a very important play, uh, and then whatever it was, three plays later. LA scored the touchdown. So that's right. Just, you know, just yeah. curious. I don't know if the call uh, came know, down yeah. and said somebody throw a flag, but it was thrown. Yeah. I think the OBJ thing, by the way, is that to me is a little karma coming back to, you know, if I'm honest, right? In, in other words, I, you know, and I'm glad he got his ring too, but ultimately, I think that's a little bit, you know, because the whole narrative that got played, you know, and this of course was Collinsworth, um, you know, which annoys me to no end as well. But the whole narrative that he got thrown out of exactly. Cleveland is like, is, is it was so tired to me. Like that whole thing was just like, no, 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 no. He didn't. I mean, no, no, that's not what happened. And, you know, portraying him as sort of a victim that got kicked out because he, you know, whatever it was like, no, no, he, he, you know. Well, Al Michaels did it too, and you're right. I mean, and we talked about this on the show, whatever it was, three or four weeks ago. I was at that, I can't remember if it was the Denver game or whatever, but I'm watching the game at Brown Stadium, and you texted me, and you said, right. OBJ is the worst player on the field right now for the Browns. They need to take him out. And he dropped like three passes that game that were very yeah. catchable. Yeah, You're right. They had to get rid of him because he, in my opinion, gave up. He was done playing. Yep. And then you see him go to play. L.A. Yeah. and blossom because he's got an amazing amount of talent. And he was in a great system. And granted, the Rams system is, was way better offensively than ours. But you're right. I think maybe they both gave up a little bit on each other. And I, I yeah, it's weird they did That's play right. that. And I was sick of hearing that during the Super Bowl. I'm like, come right. on, you uh, were there. The narrative was wrong. Yeah, you right. saw it. Exactly. So, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, exactly. all right. The news. Well, we have a yes, we have a wonderful show. Uh, we have a wonderful show planned. Of course, we will talk about those Super Bowl ads, what worked, what didn't, and yes, of course, the floating DVD screensaver Coinbase ad is among them. Um, we'll also talk about Spotify. It's only been like four minutes since we've talked about Spotify, but they have uh, made some major acquisitions uh, in the last week. Uh, Pod Sites and Chartable uh, making a play for podcast measurement. And we'll talk about what all that might mean. We'll also talk about Binance, uh, which is investing $200 million into Forbes, which just sounds weird even having it come out of my mouth. Um, 
maybe now the pop-ups can go away. Um, <laughs> but we'll talk about <laughs> we can only what hope. that really yeah, we, what that really means. And nearly a third of media is going to be on mobile this year, which is just an unbelievable stat. So we'll talk a little bit about all of that. Um, and Joe will have a little commentary about Titan, which is the John D. Rockefeller book by uh, uh, Ron uh, Chernow, Chernow yeah. with great historian. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, it's got some connections to tokens and Web 3.0, because of course it does. Um, and <laughs> Why wouldn't it? I will. Of course. Yeah. John D. Rockefeller uh, was does. way ahead of his time. He was he was into tokenization Absolutely. back in 1897. Of course. He was he was all about the NFTs and the board apes. Um and I will rave about our friend uh, Andrew Davis, uh, who has his show that he does um, called The Loyalty Loop. But the last episode of it is just a really good one. And I'm going to put a little rave out there for Perfect. our friend Andrew because he's just so yeah. awesome. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about it. Let's talk about the Super Bowl. We're going to link a couple of uh, items in the show notes here. Basically, you can't miss this. I mean, if you throw a digital rock, you will hit a article talking about the hits and misses of the Super Bowl. We're going to link to one from Marketing Dive, um, which talked to about how the Super Bowl ads this year seem to stay basically to an old script, um, which I totally agree with the idea of just, you know, featuring some B-level celebrities in all of them, so many celebrities um, made an appearance, um, and uh, talks through some of the things that worked, things that didn't work, you know, and will certainly be a nice uh, companion piece to what we'll talk about. And then we'll also talk about, uh, link to one particular um, uh, article from The Verge, which basically talks about the wonderful Bitcoin uh, uh, based, uh, or I should say Coinbase uh, ad, which was basically just a bouncing DVD screensaver. Where do you want to start? Do you want to start with what worked and what didn't and then talk about no, let's, the, let's talk, the I, Coinbase I would, thing? Or? I'd, I mean, my number one, it's funny that in this article, they talk about how USA Today, you know, rated all the Super Bowl ads and the the la- the one that came in last place was the Coinbase bouncing QR code, which I didn't agree with at all, because as soon as I saw that bouncing QR code that was so different than everything else I'd seen, I told my wife, I said, that's the, that's the best that's the best ad of the entire Super Bowl. I bet you that thing's going gangbusters right now because everyone is intrigued with what the heck is this? 60 seconds of this right. thing just bouncing and changing colors was fascinating to me. And the fact that they, I don't understand why Coinbase wasn't as prepared for the amount of traffic. I guess it was 20 million hits in, in whatever, a couple minutes, which, you know, if you're, if you're going out to 131 million people at one time, you probably are going to get that kind of a reaction from a strange ad. And they did. Dude, they totally, no, they totally wanted, they, 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 they totally engineered that thing to crash. Did, you think it was part of the even, story? Don't even, of totally. Of course. Of course it is. Of course it is part of the story. But go ahead. No, th- no your, that's fascinating. Yeah. No, that no, I, I think I'm agreeing with you now. That's fascinating because they would have known their tech people got many web servers to back this thing up. They would have been prepared for it. And you're saying because they had all the um even the art, like we weren't prepared for this type of thing. You think that was all part of the storytelling. Well, absolutely, yes. I mean, so one of the things that we got a comment on, uh, many people commented, got a couple of emails on this, got a couple of Twitter, was the my impression of the Southern Bell. It was an <laughs> so, excellent impression. I mean, <laughs> it was. So this is this is coin, you know, can you imagine Coinbase basically saying, oh my, oh my, there's so many traffic. I, so can't, <laughs> I can't handle all the traffic. <laughs> I can't handle the traffic. Um, yeah, of course they knew. Of course they knew. This was all part of the narrative to be able to release a headline the next day that says, so popular it crashed the system. I mean, how much, you know, how much more extension of that narrative do you want yeah, other true. than, you know, we, and, and by the way, the narrative is we, we prepared very much. We, we, we expected there to be a strong response, but oh my, not that much <laughs> response, you know, <laughs> you know, so. Absolutely, yeah. that was part of the story. Here. Oh, geez. Yeah. So I didn't know if you'd agree with me. So you, you thought that that stole the, the Super Bowl ads. 
You know, I, I think from a uh, look from a performance perspective, absolutely a hundred percent yes, right? So and a buzz uh, and a PR perspective. I mean, they and, got and them a buzz. All. That, yeah. that was the that was the That's one everyone right. was talking about. In yeah, the- checks all the yeah. boxes. Checks all the boxes, right? And so you know, kudos to them for having the guts to do that because you know spending because it could have gone the other way. It absolutely could have gone the other way. And they um, and by so, the way, you know, they spent. I mean, I'm just guessing here. But I don't think you have to go very far to know that they spent the least amount on production of any of the Super Bowl oh, commercials yeah. no, by right. far. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely by uh, by a hundred. Yeah, maybe spent a hundred right. bucks I mean, on a programmer throwing that around. Get the QR code ready. That's right, and change colors when that's it bounces right. off the screen. Done. That's right. Well, and the and you know, and for those of you you know, it, it, which was also covered well on social media and Reddit and all of that, which is you know you know the the classic and this is such a gen x thing with dvd players and you know screen savers screen savers which is you're waiting for it to hit the corner and it basically and so kudos to the programmer that made it hit the corner right at the point that it cut away i mean it's it was genius i mean that's just that's just a little thing that's just like you know a little a little fan service there that you just yeah, have the, to the, love. The so, Gen Xer yeah. crowd probably didn't realize the whole about the whole corner thing like we do either. I don't know. I don't know if it's out yeah, there in yeah. popular culture, like or we just play it up that oh, way. Oh, it is, of course it's out there I, in popular culture. Yeah, I've culture. seen the How many, they've done it at um, you know, they've done it at soccer matches and football games and things like that. So you see that yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. So I I thought kudos to to that team. Uh I mean of course everyone called it the crypto bowl of advertising but coinbase won, in my opinion but well how about the other ones yeah. what did you did you have some favorites so, some some ones that i lost? thought it was actually a pretty so overall i thought it was a pretty weak effort overall um other than sort of a couple i think there was you know every year seems to be you know it's a little bit like you know college uh you know draft prospects right you know so is it going to be a strong year or a weak year and i thought this year was a pretty weak year um overall but but i would say the ones that i really liked uh i think probably my favorite of the technology ones was the um larry david Mm -hmm. ad yeah um of the predictions i thought that he they captured the the culture really well right now about what's going on with NFTs and web 3.0 and all of that and sort of the predictions through the year. And of course it's classic Larry David stuff, which was very funny. Um, I thought the Facebook's meta thing with the sort of Chuck E. Cheese kind of thing was ridiculous. Oh, um, like ridiculous I, I, in I, a bad I way. Not, you thought th- ridiculous in a not yeah, good way. I think yeah, they I just confused I mean, people even more. Yeah, I think exactly. I thought there was a good idea there that was not executed particularly well. Um, and I thought the Rocket Mortgage Barbie thing uh, uh, so was, was pretty good. Yeah, I like the, uh, I I like the was, Anna Kendrick deal with that yeah. one. I thought that was pretty good. Yep. And I thought the BMW Electric with, uh, you know, the sort of, you know, classic OG uh, Super Bowl ad, the, you know, the BMW Electric car with uh, Schwarzenegger and... Um, um, blanking on her name. Uh, ah, I'll think of it here in a second. But uh, that, I thought that was cute. I thought they were, because they, they did it through a couple of different uh, commercials. They sort of, you know, they had a long, basically a longer version that they split up uh, over a couple of commercials. Those were the notable ones to me. Um, you know, a, a, the Sopranos one was also pretty good. The Sopranos, you know, sort of uh, with the Ford electric truck, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or excuse me, Chevrolet electric truck. Um, which was uh, which was also I thought really good. I, I thought they could have paid that off in a bit of a bigger way, but but and, and you know and and to me the sort of weakness of all of them was they didn't they didn't really pay it off right. It was sort of like look how cute we're being with these celebrities, but then there was no like payoff right. There was no like you know and go here for this or go there for that or or pay it off with a you know and there was a lot of uh content ads right you know for new series like the new law and order and stuff like that that was also there anyway that was that's those are my sort of overall thoughts yeah i was with you on uh i loved the larry david commercial and here's the thing but this is why it's different than coinbase i i I only remember the coinbase one i don't know which crypto company was that ftx who sponsored that 
yeah, is that FTX? I don't remember. I think the message itself is fantastic because it goes to the whole doubters about Web3. I And I know it was played beforehand, so I'd, I'd seen it before. But I think that when for the Uber Eats ad, when Gwyneth Paltrow eats the candle and says, hmm, like it's good. I think it's great. I like yeah. I and when I forgot the name of the the actress at the beginning, but when she says, "Can can we eat this?" I like <laughs> I just I think I'm, I am is this Lord of the Rings? Like what are we and I just think it's so funny when she says that every time I can watch that commercial over and over. I think again. the FTC actually had to issue a press release that said, "Please don't eat soap." <laughs> Because of that I know, commercial, I know. they actually they actually posted a press I release totally, to say, "Please I don't eat." Totally so totally agree with that one. And then I liked the keeping up with the Joneses, uh, the Toyota one. Well, with all, oh, all that was Joneses. cute. Yeah, and yeah, I like yeah, Tommy yeah. Lee Jones. And then I was trying to guess who that was going to be. It's like, okay, you got Jonas uh, coming up yeah. there. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, it was it was it was, it was cute. Yeah. I did. There had to be a record number of celebrities this year. Oh yeah, had to be because some of these, some of them had six, seven, ten celebrities in it. One oh time. yeah, there was the one that had Shatner in it, and um, oh, that's uh, the Planet Fitness one or whatever. Right, the Planet Fitness one. It had like you know four celebrities in it. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. So, anyways, again, seven point three million dollars. That goes a long way. I didn't do my post this year that I always do about what you can get for a Super Bowl ad, but man, from content creation standpoint you can get a lot and uh, well you t- we talked about it we talked about it two episodes ago right you could have had a, one of those super bowl ads or you could have bought the game wordle right you, and so which would you have which would you that's have done really right, yeah that is, that's probably the best way to look at it like you could buy an entire media company with you know a million people that are already yep. subscribed, opt in, and you have the data. Or you could interrupt yep. somebody, or hopefully not interrupt. Hopefully entertain, and hopefully do something. I don't know. What do you What do you think about the? This is two thousand Super Bowl all over again with your you know Pets dot com thing and and the whole Web three crypto thing. Do you think it's different? I you know I I do think it's different. I don't think it's I I you know. Every year has a lot of, you know, and even, by the way, there was an ad that made fun of that, right? It was um, E-Trade, I think it was, that, that put out an ad that basically had the babies coming back, mm-hmm. right? The, the, the talking babies, which, of course, was a great classic dot-com uh, uh, Super Bowl ad, and they brought it back. So I think you've got a lot of technology companies that, you know, are every year <clears throat> that are spending for big awareness campaigns. Um, and I don't think that this year was any more or less of that. You know, I mean, there was, it's a little more focused on crypto just because crypto is the topic of the day at at the moment. But, you know, I, I, I think when we look back, whatever, five years, six years, seven years from now, we're not going to point to 2022 as sort of like in the same way that we point to 2000 or 2001, where this, I think 2000 was sort of the, 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 the peak um, of the you know, dot-com Super Bowl ads with the pets.com yep. and, and those kinds of things. And, and, you know, but then <clears throat> in 2000 and 2001, almost all the ads were dot-coms, right? It, was, it wasn't even balanced. Um, and so I, I think we're not going to – I think it is different in that, from that perspective. Yeah. You know, will these companies survive? Some will, some won't, but it's not – I don't think it's the same level of hype. I and I don't want to give your rave away, but I have to mention it because I was shocked when Drew was going through his video and he talked about comparing Twitter back in the day to NFTs and looking at Google Trends. And people think right now NFTs is is in this you know huge uh, you know phase where it's going to drop like crazy like dot com did in 2001 or whatever and then he does the comparison it's like if you look at it you know nfts are bare it's an early 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 adoption phase like from a from a search standpoint and they, they says oh this is probably twitter around you know 2008 2009 and when you it gives yeah. you perspective to say yeah we're not really in the crazy times yet because still so many people are just learning about this thing and most people don't have an nft yet at this point that's most right. people are not involved that's in right. any way 
in Web3. Or know about it or really care yeah. about it. Or, or know All about it as know, expensive JPEGs. Yeah. And that's probably. That's right. It. Yeah. That's right. And so there is absolutely a, you know, a, a, you know, it is a very vocal minority right now, you know, and I can remember in those early days of Twitter, et cetera, you know, how, you know, the inside baseball people were screaming about how amazing this thing was called Twitter and, 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 and all most that. people were like, signing are you up. kidding me? This is stupid. <clears throat> right. I remember signing up for Twitter. I signed up for Twitter as I got off an airplane um, on a business trip because my colleague who was on the business trip with me had signed up for Twitter and he was like, he, he was like incredulous that I hadn't signed up yet. He was just like completely blown away that I hadn't said, this was 2000, end of 2007, I think, or yep. early 2008. And he was just like, I can't believe you haven't signed up for this thing yet. This is this is going to be the hottest thing ever. It's huge. And I'm like, all right, let me sign up. And I signed up for Twitter. And I'm like, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't, I don't mm -hmm. get this at all. And I, it took me a while to get it. And when I would talk about it with, you know, normal people, let's say, those that are outside sort of our realm of digital marketing and technology and all of that, they would be like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. Are you kidding me? Talking in 140 characters? What do you, what, that's ridiculous. And it became a thing. It, 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 you know, I mean, it'll get to our conversation, um, you know, uh, uh, that we have all the time, which is, you know, we just don't know yet. We don't know what Absolutely. The, what my, my, my son, my youngest, he is in awe that I started in December 2007. Like, he's like, Are you, oh, my God, you're one of the originals. And, and what's funny is at the time when I signed up at the end of 2007, I felt late and I was one of those idiots. Right. I was one too. of those idiots that linked up my Facebook and my Twitter so that my tweets went on my Facebook page. Oh, and, yeah. And I still have. Yeah. If you look at, at my original uh, Facebook post from 2007, when I started that, they're all tweets. And it's like, who? what idiot would do this? Well, we did. And I didn't know. I was just I was one of those guys where, hey, just spread it around everywhere. Like. Where, where I can get audience, I'll take it. it it's That's right. It's crazy. So. It is absolutely yeah. nutty. All right. Well, have we run through our, have we run I through? I think we've run through, run through enough, Super but Bowl now ads. I'm a little depressed that my Twitter account is 15 years old. <laughs> uh, I just checked mine, by the way. It was, I'm, I joined tw December of 2008. You were so, a year behind me. What were you doing? I was a year behind. I was not, I was looking at you, my friend. I was looking oh, at you. Oh, we didn't even meet the... until, wait, maybe we did. When did we meet? We had met. We had met. We had we met. met at the conference in Chicago, the met. summer of, of 2008. That's right. We met the summer of 2008, yeah. yeah. And then it took me five, met. you and I, five months of talking and you finally joined. Not that's that it right. was me. That's right. But I was like, hey, yeah. man, now, I got I 300 early, followers. I, yeah, I was early in, uh, uh, well, early-ish, I suppose, Um you know, on LinkedIn. I, I signed up right away on LinkedIn. I think I got some note from them at one point that said I was one of the first 50,000 or 100,000 or something like that to join. Um, I was really early on LinkedIn. And then on Facebook, I was also late. I didn't join Facebook until late either. Yeah, I would like to say that I joined Facebook in college because I was young enough, but no, that didn't, didn't happen. Yeah, we were... We were. <laughs> I was a MySpace guy for a long time. I was on I MySpace. Was, I, 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 I had, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cause I had, uh, my, my picture on MySpace was Peter Billingsley for some guy. Uh, <laughs> just was, that was, that's what I remember. I did the whole page up and everything. And we thought it was going to come <laughs> back when Justin funny. Timberlake bought it out, but no, didn't happen. So anyways, all right. What else we got on tap for this week? <laughs> We have uh, an interesting story, and of course, we have been talking the last couple of weeks around Spotify um, and uh, all of the sadness that they've had with Joe Rogan, which seems to have died off very quickly, quickly yep. here um, in terms of you know getting coverage, et cetera. My suspicion is it will be back um, because I think now we're seeing you know sort of the the lull in the the eye of the storm, as it were, and I think we'll probably see some stuff come back from that, but we'll see. We'll see if it actually. Uh, lasts or not, or for everybody sort of over it at this point. But Spotify continues to be in the news because they're making acquisitions, um, which they need to do to make themselves more relevant in the world of podcasting. And they have made two uh, acquisitions of note in the last week or so. Um, this 
coming courtesy of Axios. Spotify acquires pod sites and Chartable. Chartable is something we actually have used before for our own yep. measurement purposes. Spotify is acquiring pod sites, a podcast ad measurement service, and Chartable, a podcast analytics platform. Why it matters? It's the latest investments made by the audio giant to beef up its growing podcast business. The pod sites deal gives Spotify the ability to help its advertisers measure how its ads are performing. And the Chartable deal will help uh, boost Spotify's audience and promotional tools that it uses to power its advertising platform, Megaphone. Uh, our acquisitions, said Spotify, of podcasting technology players, pod sites, and Chartable are important steps in our pursuit of taking digital audio to the next level, underscoring the powerful impact it delivers for advertisers and publishers, said Don Ostroff, the chief content and advertising business officer at Spotify. Uh, so what say you, Mr. Polizzi? I, my hope is, I'll, I'll give you my sure. quick take. I have a hot take, which is I hope they make them usable. Um, having seen Chartable, having used Chartable, it's useless for the most part. Um, but I would love to get your take on, on, uh, on, you know, on, on what the uh, acquisition. Yeah. Are. This is my, my hot take on this one is that the music streaming business that they're mostly known for is a loss leader for their podcast business. And if you, Oh, that's, and that's kind of where, so they're loading up now on the podcast side because to them, I believe their long-term strategy, that's where the majority of the money is going to come in at. It's very hard to monetize streaming. And I mean, especially for the musicians, but also for Spotify as well. There's a lot of people in that line that need a cut. Well, not, not so with podcasting. You can work directly with a person, with a podcaster, with an influencer, with a content creator. You can do the deal. They can sell the ads. They can measure the ads. They can do the whole thing. They can take a much larger cut and have it be much more profitable. So I think what you're going to see Spotify do is continue to load up on services that make sense for their podcast business. And they want to be that go-to player that seemingly, and we've talked about it on this show, where it's almost like Apple's just giving it to them. Like, just says, take it. Like, we don't we don't yeah. need it. Yeah. Uh, we've never put any money into, we created this thing. We were the number one podcast player site forever. And, you know, still for the most part are. I mean, most of our listenership comes from Apple, but they don't seem to be doing anything of what Spotify's doing. So that's my take with it. it I think it's a good take. And I, I think it's interesting because I have long believed that the platform that starts to offer the best measurement for podcasters will be the one that will start to attract the best podcasters. Um, and it's because we all, as podcasters, want to know who our audience is and, and and all of that, and I think what Spotify is doing, because we've talked, we've also talked on this show about how Spotify is making some tools available through the other acquisitions Anchor. that may actually, yeah, that will that will basically transform podcasting into a much more addressable audience platform. In other words, where you can export the email addresses and and have access to your audience and get much more detail around and data around who they are and where they are and all those kinds of things. That that fundamentally shifts the podcast landscape, right? And so if all of a sudden I get, you know, and by the way, they have to have the audience as well. It's sort of a, you know, there's, there's definitely a scale here of making decisions about where you're distributing and why you're distributing. But if Spotify, now to be clear right now, even for us, Spotify is a tiny percentage of the audience that we enjoy right most of you are listening to this via apple um and 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 then it's i don't you you know better than me but it's the second one is not spotify either spotify is like fourth or fifth well then they, yeah in the first one's the apple and then you've audience. got all these like overcast and a bunch of these players that that right. uh, integrate with apple and then i think something like eight to ten percent of our listenership is is through spotify so right. not a big, not a big. So deal. if Spotify started to, if Spotify went on like a binge acquisition spree and started to buy some of these players up, these distribution layers up, that would be really interesting because if they can capture the distribution in a way that's meaningful and offer podcasters the true measurement tools and offer them the addressable audiences, that changes the game, right? And like you said, Apple seems to be just ceding this territory altogether. Like they don't really seem to care that much. Um, and I think this, you know, that would really 
get into your uh, get into your idea that basically Spotify is going to start to use music as a bit of yep. a lost leader here for the money maker, which would be paid you know paid for shows. And, and as far as basically. I can tell, Based, I mean, you know, yeah, you shows. tell me if I'm right about this one, but Spotify is the only one that has end to end horizontal from creation to distribution. They're the only one that does this. Like you can actually go to Anchor, you can upload your podcast, you can do all the things you do with creating it, and then it's got the distribution with Spotify and listeners as well, which most of those listeners are music listeners, but they'll, they'll, you know, they'll certainly become or are already becoming podcast listeners. So they have the audience that's there right. and they're growing their audience and great. So, I mean, it's, that's really quite an advantage. Uh, I mean, that's an advantage that Apple has had. It's an advantage of Amazon that they have that with their business models and Spotify really has yep. that, that advantage as well right now. They own the whole supply chain. chain. That's exactly right. Absolutely. So I could see, uh, so what else could Spotify do? What you said is absolutely perfect. I think they're going to do that. I think they'll also buy out a couple more of these um, podcast hosting services, uh, creation hosting like an anchor. There's four or five of them out there right now. I, I would anticipate Spotify in the next nine to 12 months buying two of those because... It is the year of acquisition. We've talked about it with inflation and with all yep. the cash on the sidelines that these tech companies have. They have to spend this cash. A lot of it's going to go to acquisition. Spotify is already doing that. I expect many more deals from Spotify on this. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And as soon as they own the distribution, the sort of centralized distribution, well, now they start calling the shots, right? Because now they start saying, okay, yeah, well, of course you can distribute on Apple devices through our distribution service. But... You also have the right not to do that. Um, and if you don't do that and you make it exclusive through Spotify, you'll get access to this tool or that tool or whatever you want to do. And, you know, they can start really controlling the way that, you know, and, and shaping the flow of content very much so. And you can't, you know, so Apple as the device maker there, you know, because you go, oh, well, they actually control the, you know, right now. I mean, Facebook is suffering from this right now, which is, you know, obviously Apple uh, controls the device and can say, well, we can't, you're not going to be able to track people, uh, through this kind of thing. That's fine. But basically what you're saying is, is that you either get access to Spotify distribution, distributed content, or you don't, and there'll be, you know, they'll have less leverage, right. Is the whole, is the whole point. So, um, you know, cause that's a, that's a single point, right. In other words, whether you subscribe through the web whether you go through your Android device, whether you go through you know a uh, an Apple device or whatever, a Microsoft device, you're still getting it through a single hosted uh, distribution mm-hmm. platform. That is the that's the key. Yeah, what's most interesting to me is I think what I've what I'm learning and what they knew and what a lot of people knew is that the music distribution business is terrible, and the podcast distribution <laughs> business there's <laughs> right. a lot of opportunity there. So right and and so great. They can have both models, and it's like, you know, it's like, oh, selling new cars gets me this amount of percentage. Selling used cars gets me this amount. Plus, I get service. I mean, then you're st- now you're starting to do the model and say what makes the most sense for Spotify. So, there you yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. And, by the way, that will change, too. The music, the music distribution business will also change um, because what they're dealing with is a lot of the same things that um, there's a whole space called OTT for television, right? Over the top television. And, you know, the older players here, right? Which include the cable companies and include the broadcast networks and include the, uh, many of the production companies themselves are still in these really old model contracts because they're 10 and 15 year contracts in some yeah. kind of cases, right? So distribution from, you know, the deal, for example, like a Comcast has with like a, a, you know, well, now they're called Paramount. They're not CBS Viacom anymore, but, but, you know, so a deal that they have would be carriage for their shows and royalties and the way that they pay for things over a 10 year contract. And many of the over the top sort of ideas here, streaming services, et cetera, still have to deal in that world. And, and that's the same in the music business as well. So what you're going to start to see are deals much more like what Taylor Swift made and some of the newer artists made with Spotify in terms of custom contracts. And those will start to be play a bigger role in the way that music is distributed on those services too. So 
it's all going to change, but podcasting is ripe for it, right? Podcasting has no legacy in order to unwind, and they can start to build themselves a corner of the market there. It's, still, it's, it's a yeah, smart still, move. I mean, Very podcasting really is still only 20 years old, so it's, it's yeah. quite young. If even, Yeah, right? if even. Yeah. If that. All yeah. Right. All right. Uh, let's cover one more story here before we get to our rants and raves here, which would be that Binance uh, has now invested $200 million into Forbes which just sounds odd. Um, <laughs> this story is coming to us via a site called Blockworks, uh, blockworks.co. And basically the headline here is, just as I read it, the Binance is going to invest $200 million into Forbes and bring Web 3.0 to journalism, says the headline, uh, in a very clickbaity kind of way. Uh, and the article opens up by saying, Binance, one of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world, has committed a $200 million strategic investment into global media company Forbes. So you read further and go, what does that mean? As part of the investment, uh, Patrick Hillman, who is the chief communications officer at Binance, and Bill Chin, head of Binance's labs, are expected to join Forbes' board of directors the quarter. Uh, basically, uh, as they see it, you know, you have to get further down into this to sort of start to unwind what's going on here. Um, basically, what they're doing is so remember, Forbes is supposed to go public via this SPAC. Um, and uh, which we've talked about on the show before. And with this investment, some of the other investors who are Chinese, quite frankly, um, can now withdraw some of their money. So this kind of an investment in a company that might go public via a SPAC. And there's a lot, there, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes here that's not covered in this. Um, but what do, you, what do you make of this whole thing in a media kind of deal? Something... So I when I read this, I'm like something smells wrong, because this yeah. they're supposed to go public any time now. So something with the spec, which I think, if I recall correctly, that was a six hundred million dollar offering. Right, that's right. So here's a third of it is being assumed by uh, Binance, and so the whole thing's weird. I'm, I, first of all, I was like, okay, well, Binance just should have bought out. Forbes, Forbes entirely right. spend Shouldn't another three hundred right. million dollars, right. which they have, because they're very very well funded. Just go ahead and buy them if that's what they want to do. That instead of saying, "Oh, we're going to buy this portion and then we'll be able to be somewhat influential in the Web three content offerings," that just seems, seems weird. Oh, to just buy the thing. So there, yeah, there's there's something crazy going on. So Binance's founder is from Singapore, I believe. So yeah, right. so there's something going on there. Uh, by the way, uh, Zhao, uh, the CEO of Binance, is worth an estimated ninety-six billion dollars. What? Jeez, that's that's yeah, just nuts. That's so this is amazing. this is this is just uh, you know couch cushion change for him as he's doing right. this deal. That's right. Uh, yeah, it, it's and we're gonna see this a little bit more. I think we've seen it happen with Fortune. We're seeing it happen with Forbes. You've got these venerable brands that really do have some value, but nobody wants knows what they want to do with them. Uh, I think when the SPAC market was hot, something like this made sense. Of course, SPACs got cold as cold could be uh, really quickly. So, And here we are. So they probably think that they, they can't even come out of that $600 million valuation. This feels like, to me, this feels like the kind of thing where two guys sitting in a bar, one of them invested into Forbes and really regretting it, <laughs> you know, basically saying, God, I don't know why I put so much money into Forbes. And this Zhao guy going, oh, I can, uh, uh, yeah, I'll make you whole there. What, what, what you got? 200 million? Fine. I'll go, I'll go invest 200 million into Forbes. You pull your money out. They go public. Everybody wins. And you get out. And I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> and the guy goes, all right. I, I think that's what it feels like to me is, is, like you said, this is couch cushion money for, for, for Zhao. Um, uh, you know, uh, from a strategy perspective, it makes zero sense. I, 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 I have no idea why, you know, unless they were going to buy them outright. Because with an investment, they can't go, well, we're going to influence the amount of article. I mean, that's that just seems wrong, too. That's just a bad PR play, yeah. right? That's just a bad marketing communications and brand play to basically go, oh, yeah, we invested $200 million so that they would basically 
switch over their journalism. I mean, look, journalism is a word that's loosely <laughs> associated with Forbes um, these days. By their own doing, so, by you know, to. They oh, purposely yeah, of course. did this. Um, yeah. st- that's right. So, I mean, now, from an SEO perspective, it's got amazing uh, SEO uh, and gets a lot of attention and a lot of traffic. But, you know, let's be honest here. It's not, it's not the, you know, venerable business journalism brand yeah. that it used to be. Um, and so I, I, from a, from a content marketing perspective, I look at this and just go, it just baffles me, but from an investment standpoint, from a, you know, money going here and money going there, I'm sure it makes sense to somebody. Just I guess weird. I, I would just say that if you want to see a demonstration of your web experience gone wrong, just go to Forbes.com and click on an article. Yeah, exactly. It is literally right. like, and we've said this, it's literally like that moment in Ready Player One where IOI wants to take over and says, we can we can make 98% of the screen with ads or something like that before they go into a seizure. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Come yeah. on. Like why? It's I'd love good. for somebody to get this thing and just say, we're going to put, take a hacks out of this thing and remake it because there's an opportunity to do that because Forbes has still got a great brand. It's not yeah, good. It's not good. It's getting away. It's not good. It's it's, it's not, not good. good. Not good. It's not yeah. good. I do declare it's not good. So you're going to have to do it's that every episode good. now since you got so yeah, many I know, comments I know. on that. People like it. Yeah, people like it. Yeah, who knew? I always, like yeah, I always liked the, the Sean Connery, but but I think that you found your new niche. I have lost my Sean Connery. I was listening to our episode last week when I did a Sean Connery with the one ping only. Um, and I've just I I'm gonna have to practice it some more because I just I've lost it. I used to have great okay, Sean I have Connery. To, I have and well, I, just, I have to tell you something. When, when you're drinking, yeah. you've got it spot on. So you so you if yeah, you want to well, do it for that. the show, yeah, you're gonna definitely. have to get a little tequila. And I, yeah. fine, fine. I'm I'm more than happy to to, to do that. <laughs> um, all right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for your favorite and empirically proven uh, favorite part of the show, our rants and raves, where Joe and I go off on a little bit of a rant or a little bit of a rave over something that makes us feel like we've uh, performed at the halftime show of the Super Bowl, or quite frankly, uh, did you see the um, the virtual reality one, the 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 sort of the some of the clips from the the VR no, experience that Verizon no. sponsored. It wasn't that great. I mean, it was it was weird. It was just odd uh, to me. I mean, it was kind of neat to see it from their point of view, from the like inside the room where Fifty Cent hung upside down. You got to see it from oh, that got point it. of view. Okay. But it was just odd. It was just wasn't very good quality, and it was it was just it was just weird. Um, anyway, to, but but yeah, make us feel a little like that. So, uh, shall I go first since I have a very quick thing? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mine's quick too. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So we talked about it. Uh, a few minutes ago when we talked about Andrew Davis and, and, and his show. So Andrew has a show called Loyalty Loop, um, which is just, he's been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, and it's fantastic show. I mean, it's it, every time I see it, it makes me jealous because he's just such a, I mean, he, I, I know for a fact that he edits it himself. He shoots it himself. He, he It's a one man thing. Um, and it's, it looks every bit as good as any TV show you'd ever see. I mean, it's just, Really well done, um, annoyingly so. How it well is done annoying. It is quite frankly, yeah. um, um, and but this month he has uh, he's talking about the what he calls the next big thing in his episode, his loyalty loop episode, and he starts out by saying he's got FOMO for those who are sort of diving into the Web 3.0, the NFT. He doesn't understand it. He's overwhelmed, but he definitely has FOMO because he sees his friends all getting into this uh, and getting their own creator coins and doing all these things. And then he wants to talk about a framework. And he has this framework for basically how you can keep up and how you can, you know, sort of uh, think about things, these new evolutions, these, these, you know, and keeping up and those sorts of things. And it's just really good. It's just, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's classic Andrew Davis, but it, but it's just really wonderfully done and i just have to give it a big shout out because it's just i i i admire him so much and i admire this piece of content that he did so much i wanted to give it a a big rave so and, there and, you go and just he go gets watch a lot it. of views on it but he should get a million more views on his shows because totally. they're so good and helpful totally. and professional and yeah. yeah everything about it is just disgusting because i don't think yeah. i can do that well it's, it's a, 
Well, that's exactly right. So it, it, you know, you go watch that and you go, oh, uh, it, 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 it makes you go, uh, I, 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 now I got to go do my little thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, now I'm going to go, I'm going to do my little, anyway, to me, it, 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 it's sort of like, ah, oh, that's, that's what I want to shoot for. So anyway, from a quality standpoint, and you're right, absolutely right. He should get a ton more attention than he it's gets so for good. it. So good. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully this helps a tiny little. But that's where we talked about before where he did, and he, he always, he's probably the first one that really got me into Google Trends. And I use Google Trends all the time. I use it for, you know, audience research, and you do it look at, look at what's going on from you know year over year. And when he did the comparison of Twitter and NFTs, it's mind blowing where we're at. We're so, we're barely anything with NFTs, so it's just it's a good reminder right. to to reset yourself and to say, okay, well, you're not late. You're probably really early, so it's a really good time to experiment and and exactly uh, and not get so. <laughs> So like in the in the dirt, like I I have to hate this. I hate you know it, it's I remember and what you know here's what's surprising to me, and I know we'll talk a, a lot about this on our our next episode. But I see those mm-hmm. people that were out front first with social media, and a lot of those people are the first ones. And this is back in oh six oh seven oh eight, they're the first ones to go out there and they are yelling about the the, the negative about Web three, and I'm like. Yeah. You were the ones out there doing the same thing and now you're you're what is it because you're older or you're what you because you got grandkids now like what's the <laughs> what's the deal? Why don't we keep an yeah. open mind about this thing? We don't know. We don't know. So do we? we Good don't. stuff. Okay. Yeah. What so, do you got? I'm st- <laughs> I'm on page 100 and something of Titan. <laughs> uh, Titan is Ron Chernow's book that he wrote years ago on John D. Rockefeller. Great writer. And Great writer. That, the book is is something like 17,000 pages long. It, it is literally the size of two bricks. Um, so I'm going to do my best, but, I, but I've heard so many good things about it. And by the way, John D. Rockefeller made his fortune in Cleveland, Ohio. And we've got lots of buildings and lots of things around Cleveland that are named Rockefeller. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that, but and probably one of the reasons why the the lake caught on fire in the seventies was because of what Rockefeller did with the oil industry. But that's beside the point. That's beside the yeah. point. I just want to read something. This is from page one hundred and four. Uh, it says the elite Wall Street bankers preferred to finance railroads and government and regarded oil refining as a risky, untested business. Nothing short of outright gambling. There's a lot of in this section of the book where John D. Rockefeller starts getting into oil, there's a lot of discussion about how this is a new technology. It's unproven. Uh, there was a lot of shadiness that people thought was going on. Uh, and I I just thought that, oh, my God, this is 100 years ago. And we're going through this yet again with what's going on with Web3. And that's immediately what I thought of. You got Wall Street is shaking their heads. They don't believe in it. People don't want to finance these things. There is a lot of shady stuff going on. But among all of it, there are some amazing things going on and amazing creations going on. But a lot of people, a lot of us miss that. So, And that's what, that's what was happening during Johnny Rockefeller's time. While everyone was looking at basically financing in the railroads, there was this huge thing about oil and the cars were just about to explode and they got he got involved in it with a number of entrepreneurs that weren't making anything and doing anything and boom, they became quickly the richest people in the world. Um, it's interesting to see how that's... When we when we look at Bitcoin billionaires and crypto billionaires, like we're seeing that happen before our eyes right now. So I just thought it was interesting. I don't know if I can get through the rest of this book, Robert. I just don't know. <laughs> it's and and by yeah. the way, he, I read I read long, his books are long on yeah, detail. I for read sure. uh, ha- about half of Hamilton because, as you know, I'm a big Lin Manuel oh, Miranda that fan. Favorite. That's my favorite. That's yeah, my I love yeah. I loved Hamilton the musical. So, and I so I watched Hamilton the musical first and then read the book second, which most people probably did the opposite. Yeah. But again, he's so detailed. Like knows everything. It's like, well, John D Rockefeller's uh daughter's uh daughter dated this person back in, you know, 1942 and did this and went to the grocery store and I'm like, "Oh god, Jesus, I didn't know need to know all that." But great amount of detail. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, so I'm, I'm a student of, uh, and spent about uh, five years, um, in the early two thousands when I was actually, you know, so I, I, 
I mean, I went down the rabbit hole of the American Revolution and just I've devoured every book I could on it. Just I really wanted to learn it. Um, and basically, you know, the the roughly the 15 years of that period, right? So roughly the, you know, call it 17, well, call it 30 years, 1770 to 1800, yeah. right? You the know, start so, of our country. So that's that's yes. really the period. Yeah. And I so the two, two books in there that are notable are Chernow's Hamilton book uh, and Chernow's uh, Washington, his his book on Washington. Um, they're amazing. I mean, they're 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 just amazing books. But yeah, they're 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 uh, they're adventures. Let's put it that way, because they are not short on detail. Yeah, it's like it's like uh, the answer to what did you do thing. last summer? Uh, you read, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you read Washington. Read Ron Chernow is yeah. what you did. Yeah, it just takes some time. All right, good. What do you got? Uh, what do you got going on right. this weekend? I, sir? I got uh, I got I got a lot of content to create. Um, you know, I got uh, some promo videos I got to do. I got some. Uh, I got a. Sh- I got a new episode of this show that I'm doing for uh, for a company called Contention. Um, so I'm doing this show called The Top Five and Fifteen, which is a top five content items Ooh. coming out of their very, very large database. I got 500,000 pieces of content in their database, business to business content. And it's sort of like, I'm doing like the Casey Kasem countdown of the top 10. It's a fun show to do. Um, so I got my second episode of that. I got to record uh, and do all that. So I'm going to be looking, of course, to <laughs> Andrew Davis for inspiration. Um, and uh, yeah, other than that, just sort of relaxing and getting outside a little bit and uh, not watching any football because football, football is, is now done. over. It's now yeah, now you got to watch dark space of NASCAR sports. NASCAR and golf and there won't be any baseball. The Olympics, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You won't get yeah, to watch something. any of that. So yeah, how about you? Uh, you know, we're, we're just putting the final touches on the entire agenda for Creator Economy Expo. So I'm very excited to get that out there. We worked very, very hard. I heard you added a new speaker. Uh, We did. I added added a new speaker. Um, He's he's somewhat well-known in the content marketing space. But no. (laughs) Not at all known in the content creator (laughs) space. No, no, I'm so happy. Of course, I couldn't uh, do an event without having my wonderful sidekick, Robert Rose, a part of it. So thankfully, you were available. And you're going to be part of the extravaganza yeah. as well. But, you know, we, it worked really, really hard to get a number of speakers from very diverse backgrounds. And, you know, and of course, you try to cover a little bit of everything. We're talking about the business of content. So we've got to cover TikTok and Twitch and Instagram and email and podcasting. And I think we've done a pretty good job of doing all that. So May 2nd to 4th, by I'm the way, show up early birds learn. coming yeah. up again. Early bird learn, discounts basically. are going to go yeah. away soon. So, you know. We want to see you there. It's going to be fun. I'm really looking forward. Yeah. Well, you know what I like too. This it's a different audience than we've done before because a lot of the people are going to the Arizona Grand and they're bringing their families with them and they're doing like a nice little retreat getaway thing because you can do that. They've got a water park and the whole thing. So I like <laughs> I like seeing that. Yeah. I like that people are going to bring their significant others and their kids and you know that kind of thing too. We've never really done an event like that before, so. We will see. I won't be bringing my kids, but other people might. Right. Yeah. I, I, and I don't have any kids to so, bring. There so you there, there you go. go. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that is it. We are going to sign off for this episode. Uh, next week, we got a little bit of a special episode for you. Um, so you may want to stay tuned for that. Um, but in the meantime, if you want to get all the wonderful links that we talked about in this episode or any of the other 310 episodes, get on over to our website at thisoldmarketing.site. Hey, folks, reviews, shares, all that kind of stuff. Help us out, won't you? If you like this, share it with a friend. Get somebody else to start listening to this nonsense. Hashtag us up at This Old Marketing with story ideas. We so appreciate all those story ideas on the hashtag on Twitter. And until we meet again, just remember it's your story to tell. Tell it well. We'll see you next week on This Old Marketing.